morning we talk about the great evil daylight saving time. No, Satan. We talk about Satan. The timing was pretty good. Where we left off last week, we talked about the Heavenly Council, and we ended with the somewhat surprising fact that Satan is invited to this. It's, uh, we decided it was, it's analogical language. It's, it's not really that God is sitting at the head of a conference table asking everyone to give an account of the supernatural powers, but it is something close enough to that, that that's the analogy that's used or the language that's used. But much to our surprise, as God is governing the universe and he uses means to govern the universe, one of the means that he uses to govern the universe is in fact Satan. And so we were surprised to find Satan having a seat at that table, so to speak. And so we talked about how to understand that and how God both uses evil and the sin of others for his own purposes, how he is not responsible uh, how he's not to blame for sin. He is not the one committing the sin. He's not making anyone sin. They're doing freely what they want to do. And yet, for the suffering that comes as a result of that sin, the suffering that we experience, God is responsible for that. If he did not in some way will for it to be, it would not be. His sovereignty is absolute. And we talked about, I mean, that's, that's reasonably challenging. That's a tough thing to sort through in our minds. It will end up being the only answer that could be any good for us. <laughs> the alternatives are worse, but it's still challenging. And part of why it's particularly challenging today or this day and age is that we live in a culture that for some time now has denied the value of, of suffering has, has tried to remove all of the hard things from life and has basically said hard cannot be good. Difficult cannot be good. If it's unpleasant, it is by definition bad. Uh, we used to have the expression no pain, no gain, and people use that now with exercise but that's about it. They don't use it in terms of thinking about God refining us as with fire, and that sort of pain brings about moral and sanctifying gain in our lives. Now we talk about safe spaces. We talk about avoiding offense at all costs. You have a right not to be offended. We talk about microaggressions. We talk about trigger warnings. We talk about things like zero COVID. Think about that, zero. What the world needs is, is zero. And we should do whatever it takes to get to zero. I uh, personally, not, there is nothing wrong to choosing charitable organizations to support. Uh, there's pros and cons with every organization you pick. So we're all just sort of making up the guidelines that we use to decide who we're gonna uh, contribute to or who we're gonna try to help. But one of the principles I've adopted over the last few years is I don't support organizations that tell me they're gonna eliminate anything. If their message is eliminating racism, eliminating poverty, eliminating homelessness, eliminating cancer, I just don't want to support them because I would prefer an organization that has an achievable goal. I like to give my money to accomplish achievable goals and these things cannot be eliminated. We should alleviate the, the pain and suffering of them. We should help people who are burdened by them. We should research ways to minimize and mitigate their risks. But this idea that we're gonna live in a pain-free, suffering-free, poverty-free, homeless-free world is madness. It's, it's not reality. What we're saying by that, and we saw this a lot in COVID, and this is gonna be important, connected to Job in important ways, all of these these things, these safe spaces and avoiding offense and zero COVID, all of these things say that the most important thing for a human being is physical safety. And the second most important thing for a human being is emotional safety. And that's what most of the world believes. When, when people say things like, I got out of this situation because I deserve to be happy, what they're saying is that their emotional safety is of the highest value. I am not saying physical safety is unimportant. I am not saying emotional safety is unimportant. 
I'm saying we make very strange decisions. We make a lot of wrong decisions in a world where those things are seen as the most important things. Because what it means is that anything unsafe is wrong. And when you're judging a God who lets it happen, anything unsafe, anything that causes suffering, anything that causes pain or any kind of unpleasantness is evil. Of course we don't want to suffer. Of course we take reasonable steps to avoid suffering. But we cannot equate suffering with wrong. And one of the challenges of Job is going to be God is responsible for the suffering of Job and God does no wrong. Those two things are both true. And we live in a world that cannot fathom that that is the case. Anything that causes suffering must be wrong. But that's not what Job says. Calvin, uh, the, the Genevan pastor and reformer, thought that this was Job's greatest contribution to our reading of the Bible. He said, we must not try to make God render account to us. We must so reverence his secret judgments that we consider his will the truly just cause of all things. And then because he's Calvin, he does some beautiful word, uh, word pictures here. He says, when dense clouds darken the sky and a violent storm arises, when a gloomy mist is cast over our eyes, thunder strikes our ears, and all our senses are numb with fear, when everything seems to us to be confused and mixed up, all the while, there is a constant, quiet serenity in heaven. And from this, we must infer that while the disturbances in the world cloud our understanding, God, out of the pure light of his justice and wisdom, directs these very movements to a right end. It's a great question to ask ourselves in the tumult of life, in the dark clouds in the things that cause pain and suffering. What does God think about this? How is God, again, analogical language, giving human terms to God, how does God, um, how does God feel about what is happening? Is God afraid? No. Then why should I be afraid? Right? That's a good exercise to sort of work through. God has directed all of these movements to a right and just end. Uh, there's lots of unpleasantness in them, but there's no, there's no sin from God. And therefore, we don't have anything to fear in them. The, we use the Heidelberg Catechism a lot around here, and I was going to get one of the kids to come in and do it this morning and forgot. But question and answer 28 asks, what does it profit us to know that God has created and by his providence still upholds all things. So what good is it to us, this knowledge that God created and upholds everything at all times? What good does that knowledge do us? And the Catechism says that we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and with a view to the future may have good confidence in our faith that no creature shall separate us from God's love since all creatures are so in his hand that without his will, they cannot so much as move. There is absolutely nothing that is happening that is outside the will of God. And if we step away from the uh, attempts at logical justification with God, God, you've got to defend your actions to me. If we set that aside for a moment, and we just focus on the factual statement that all of it is within God's control, it should cast out all fear. It should give us a different approach to suffering. That while suffering is unpleasant and we should take reasonable, prudent steps to avoid it, when suffering comes and is inescapable, God has in it a very good purpose for us. And of course, the purpose of his own glory, which we'll work through in the book.
Um, that wraps up kind of the defense of why Satan has a seat at the table and how God is blameless for sin and responsible for all that takes place. Questions about that, and then I want to talk a little bit about Satan himself, what we know about Satan, what we learn here, what we see elsewhere in Scripture. Any questions on this heavenly council? I'm just glad you made it at all. We could easily be asleep in our beds. <laughs> all right, what do we learn about Satan? In 2 Peter, we learn that Satan is one of the angels who rebelled against God. So that's 2 Peter 2.4. Uh, he left his proper dwelling, at, which is in the heavenly courts in the presence of God in obedience to God's will. He left that. And so now he leads the superhuman, the supernatural forces of evil in the heavens. Who does somebody have Jude 6? Oh, sorry. Let me read Jude 6. Which is, I'm going to write 1 6, but it's just Jude. And somebody else line up Ephesians 6 12, if you would. So, Jude 6. six. And, the angel, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And Ephesians 6.12, yeah. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Satan is very powerful. He is super, he is a supernatural creature. He's very powerful. But he is a creature. He is no threat to God. He is not equal to God in anything. He is utterly derivative. God is always the one in control. And Satan is a tool, like we talked about last week, that God uses for the accomplishment of his purposes. Scripture uses a lot of different forms, images and analogies for Satan. It has a lot of different ways to describe, uh, again, analogical language or uh, anthropomorphic language, kind of humanizing features. What's the first form that Satan takes in the Bible? A serpent, yeah. Genesis 3, right? What is the form that Satan famously takes throughout the book of Revelation? Dragons. Lots of forms and images. But also, you think about texts like John 8. Satan is described as a roaring lion. He's described as a tempter. He's described as a liar and a murderer. That's John 8 language. So Satan is one of God's creatures who was created for the glory of God, who rebelled against God, and instead of being used for God's glory via righteousness, Satan is used for God's glory. He will achieve the purposes for which God created him, but Satan is used for God's glory through evil, the wickedness that he does. Who, uh, could somebody do 1 Kings 22? 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. Uh, and Micaiah said, <laughs> Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand, and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing, and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. 
Does anybody remember this story? <laughs> right? We think about God using Satan so directly as being the Job story, and that's it. But that's not it. Uh, we have this example here in 1 Kings, where God needs uh, for his purposes to not, that's a, not a careful way to say it, for God's purposes to be accomplished, the, the deception that takes place utilizes the evil of someone who wants to do evil and freely chooses evil and utilizes what Satan wants to do, which is to tempt and prompt someone to freely do evil. And God says, that's what you want. That's your desire. That is your choice for which you are utterly responsible. Here is how everything that you want and do will serve my purposes and my glory. And so, yes, you can go do that. And that's what will happen here in just a, a bit with Job when we get to uh, next week's passage. In Hebrew, the, the Satan is, an, is a title. It's, it's, it's closely connected to being the accuser. It becomes a name, but it really is a title, the accuser. And that will be his attack on Job, won't it? <laughs> I mean, we focus on what Satan does in the destruction of the stuff, the causing of sickness and death and poverty. But really the only reason Satan is doing that is because he wants to prove his point in his accusation that Job's faith is phony. And in his, in his making of the case of what he cares about most, God, no one actually just loves you because you're you. No one actually just serves you because you're God. They always have a motive. They always have an agenda. They always have some reason for themselves. And Job is no exception. And so all the junk, the suffering that comes into Job's life, the book is not about the suffering in that sense. It's about whether or not Job's faith is genuine and Satan, the accuser, says it's not. And God lets Satan do a whole lot to try to prove his case that Job's faith is fake. That accusation is the, the, the question mark throughout the book of Job. Um, Satan doesn't see true goodness behind Job. We talked about a great man and a good man. And Satan says the goodness is results-based. Because God made him great, Job is willing to be good. But if God takes away the greatness, then Job will abandon the goodness. He charges Job, accuses Job of false religion. And I think that's a really important point to harp on for a minute because that is exactly what Satan still does today. Satan is the accuser. It's what he does. What, whatever thought comes to your mind about the, the fakeness of your religion, the superficiality of your faith, the flimsiness of your righteousness, the weakness of your devotion, I can tell you with certainty Satan is behind that. That is what he does. He makes accusations. God doesn't love you. God doesn't love is one accusation. And Satan knows that if we've read our Bibles for like five minutes, we can do away with that accusation pretty quickly. God does love. But the other part is tougher. God doesn't love you. And now Satan says, what are you going to do with that? Look at your circumstances. If God loved you, would this stuff happen? If God loved you, would your life be like this? That's what Satan is saying. That's what Satan is trying to say to Job. But Job's life is so good, it's easy to look at Job's life and say, yeah, it's pretty clear God loves Job. Look at all this great stuff. And look at this family. Everything's perfect. So Satan says, yeah, yeah, but God, if I get rid of all this good stuff and Job isn't great anymore, and then I come right back to Job and I say, Job, if God loved you, would your life be like this? Job will curse God and die. That's his accusation. And that's why he does all of this. He wants to bring that case, make that accusation against Job, and God lets him adjudicate the case. It's for Job's good, it's for God's glory, and it is very much for our good, for the good of all those who come after Job and read about everything that happened here. 
he in in Job uh, in this heavenly council discussion in these verses Satan will be described as wandering the earth God asks him what he's found in his wanderings it's this idea that Satan is constantly roaming the New Testament uses the language of prowling right Satan is constantly searching for something he's lo- he's on the hunt for something So have you ever asked yourself, what is Satan on the hunt for? Well, this answers it. He's on the hunt for genuine and false faith. Satan is out on the earth. You can easily deal with those who don't have faith. But Satan looks at the ones who claim to have faith. And it seems that his task, or at least part of his unfortunate task from our perspective, is to look for genuine and false faith. And that's why Satan can, I'm going to say he can be seen. I just mean we are more cognizant of the evil one at work in the lives of self-righteous practitioners. Right? People who claim to have such strong faith and such righteousness, but ultimately you can see that they're out for themselves and they do what's best for them. And you know the evil one is working through the things that they're doing and the hypocrisy between what they're saying and what they're doing. We see Satan in that. Um, he's, he's at work in uh, those who are doing evil against God's people as he wants to bring an assault on faith. Genuine faith is really offensive to Satan. He, he, he argues with God here that it doesn't exist and that every example of it is fake. And it seems like he's got this task of looking around for it. Um, evil Satan himself is offended by genuine faith because genuine faith is an assault on Satan's identity. S- Satan, uh, to speak uh, uh, uncarefully, anthropomorphically for a minute. Did I say porkifly? <laughs> <laughs> that word. To speak of Satan in human terms for a minute. Satan bet the farm on this idea that God is not God and not worthy of love simply for being who he is. Satan's entire identity is wrapped up in the rebellion against God as God. Satan was made an angel, a a blameless creature to serve God. He chose rebellion. He decided for himself, God is not worthy of love and honor. And what do people do when the most important part of their worldview is denied by someone else? They get mad. They go on the attack. And so everyone who says God is worthy of all honor and praise and love is calling Satan a liar and saying that Satan really messed up here. Satan chose poorly. That's the Indiana Jones. He chose poorly. (laughs) And Satan is outraged by the idea that he's wrong. And it leads him to this sort of supernatural self-delusion where Satan rejoices when Jesus is on the cross. He thinks he wins. It's a great, the the Chronicles of Narnia description of the white witch and her armies when Aslan is on the stone tablet is the best sort of mental picture I've ever had for what that must have been like. And most of us know the end of that book. (laughs) We know the end of that book even when we're reading that scene. And so in the back of your mind is this, oh, this isn't going to end well for you. (laughs) This This is about to go really bad for you. But Satan still lived within that delusion, that self-deception that God is not God and that his rebellion, as I said in the sermon a month or so ago, is is purposeful, is actually going to accomplish something. He's going to be somebody. And in the end, everything he does will amount to nothing. He will have been used to do the very things he was trying to rebel against, which is the glory of God and the good of God's people. And you'll look at that and you'll say, yeah, Satan played a part in that. He chose to play a part in that. He didn't choose the outcome, but he chose everything he did. And God ordained and orchestrated all of this 
so that the outcome would be secure. Um, say, so in the book of Job, Satan is the one on the prowl looking for these things, and he comes to the heavenly council, and he denies the existence of genuine faith. There's no such thing. Nobody loves you or serves you just because you're God. And that is what prompts God's question. Have you seen my servant, Job? Have you considered Job? And God knows that Satan did see Job on his prowling around and looking for genuine faith. And Satan is pretending that Job's faith isn't real or pretending that Job exists or something. And so God pushes the issue. Um, and uh, Derek Thomas in his commentary on this says, in his malevolence, Satan is irrational. He has lost his grip on reality. He knows intellectually, we should be a little sympathetic Again, not speaking carefully. We should be a little sympathetic with Satan on this point because he intellectually knows God is all-powerful. He doesn't believe it or live as if it's true. Yeah. That is, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I won't throw any stones at that one. So they get to this council, and who's in Job? Job, read uh, 1, 6, and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. So God asks, which from God is a demand. You do notice that Satan doesn't have the option of not answering God here. <laughs> we'll talk in a minute about uh, in, the, in the sermon. Jesus very much has the option of not answering Pilate's question. Pilate will ask him, where are you from? Pilate has not done anything in this story to prove that he is deserving of an honest answer. He doesn't even know what truth is or whether or not it exists, but he's asking Jesus to give him a true answer. So Jesus just says nothing. Uh, Pilate is not owed an answer. God is owed an answer. So he asks Satan, and I'm going to say he demands an answer, but it's not like he has to demand it by force. God asks for it, and every creature he's made knows God is owed this. No matter how much they hate God, want to rebel against God, to resist God is utterly futile in that way. So Satan is an unwilling participant in this meeting. He doesn't want to be here, and yet he has to show up. And he's obligated to answer God's questions, to participate. Calvin, uh, to quote him again, I, I think he's really great on Job, so you'll hear me use him a lot. He said, The Holy Spirit means us to understand that it's not only the angels of heaven who obey God willingly, but also the devils of hell, enemies and rebels to him, to the uttermost of their power. While they labor to subvert his majesty, yet they are forced through gritting teeth to be subject to God and to yield to him account of all their doings. They cannot do anything without his permission and leave. And again, it's just, this is such an important point, which is why I'm beating this drum over and over again. There is nothing that happens in Job, because there is nothing that happens, period, that is outside of God's sovereign will. Nothing. Now, we can have a side discussion, and maybe we should at the end, about the, the different types of God's will. Because when we say something is God's will, we use that term in a few different ways, and sometimes it can get muddled up. But if God, if what was most important to God was that something not happen, it would not happen. There are lots of things that are important to God, but if what was most important to him was that Job not lose his stuff. Job would not lose his stuff, period. So whatever it is that God desires for you, just as with Job, whatever it is that God desires for your children, for if God desired it, it is, it will be. And when it doesn't happen and we look at it and say, this is horrible, it should have happened or this thing shouldn't have happened, the emotional response is legitimate. Suffering is bad. It's suffering. It hurts. And still, 
this has got to be our comfort. In fact, this is our only comfort because everything else gets really troubling. Because what are the things, let's, let's do that exercise for a minute. What are the alternatives? What, what, what are the options that are possible if we're talking about when bad things happen with respect to God? One option we said is that God sovereignly ordained it. He's not responsible for evil, but he is responsible for our suffering. He has a purpose in that suffering for his glory and for the good of his people. And that hurts and it's painful, fully grant you. But that's option A. God is sovereignly in control of that thing taking place. What are some other possible options? What's that? For our sake. I'm going to put that under A. That's one of his sovereign purposes is to make us holier. What's an entirely different category, though, of what might someone else say about evil in the world? If all of you believe option A, great. What might someone else say about all the evil in the world? That karma. You can't stop it. Can't stop it. Like, um, it's not really God. It's just, yeah, powerless. He doesn't care. So maybe B is powerless. <laughs> C is not powerless, but not as strong as evil. Whether that's karma, whether that's Satan, you know, he just can't stop all the evil. He'll win on the whole. But he's going to lose a lot along the way because other things are powerful and evil is powerful. So that's an option. Okay. Uh, so one is that God's powerless to stop evil. He's not powerless, but he can't stop it all the time. He's not quite as strong. It's a fallen world. You deserve it. So, yeah, uh, another way to say that would be, we're kind of combining those two. These both deal that he's not, these deal with his power, his ability to do something about it. What y'all are getting at is his desire to do something about it. So those are effects of his love. God is not all loving. If God were all loving, God's people wouldn't suffer because he is all powerful. That's what some people say. Some Christians say that. Some Christians say God's all loving. He wishes he could do something about it, but he just can't stop it. A, 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 another sort of subcategory of that is he's all loving. He wishes he could do something about it. He's all powerful. He could do something about it, but God is most devoted to human freedom. God, you know, God is not going to make you do something you don't want to do. Um, even if it means, and again, this is where we get into the, we thought the first one was bad. That God sovereignly ordaining this stuff puts God in a pickle. What do the rest of these say about God? He's either not all powerful, and he's not God. He's not God in any meaningful sense of the word. If you can say God can't, and finish that sentence with something other than deny his own existence. <laughs> or God is not good. Does that make you feel better? I have all the suffering in my life that I wish I didn't have. It's a valid statement. And my way of intellectually, mentally resolving my suffering is to say God is not good. And that's supposed to make me feel better? I serve an arbitrary, capricious, not quite so good God? That does not make me feel better. Option E, God is most devoted to human freedom. He's powerful and he's good and loving. I'm, I don't know how you could, that option that God is most devoted to human freedom is irreconcilable with saying that God is loving. Are you so devoted to your children's human freedom and to them learning a lesson that you let them run out in traffic? I mean, who, who talks that way? That's nonsense. To say that, well, God doesn't want people to be puppets. 
So he lets them destroy their lives and condemn their souls to hell. What madness? Like, that doesn't make anybody feel better about anything. So in the realm of options that are intellectually and emotionally challenging for us, I agree, they're all intellectually and emotionally challenging for us. The one that is the most consistent with scripture, which is the only thing that matters, also happens to be the only one that can give you comfort and hope. The only one. <laughs> because all the alternatives mean that God may not necessarily even get what he wants in the end. And the people who are really consistent on E, on this devotion to human freedom, he's not who he says he is, and they end up if they're logically consistent, and most of them aren't, and I'm thankful that most of them aren't because I don't want them to go down this path, but if you're logically consistent on E, you end up what's called an open theist, which is that God cannot know the future, not with certainty, because if he cannot ordain human action, humans are free to do every single thing they want apart from God. How can God know what they will do? If it's 5 a.m. Again, this is analogical uh, language, so that we're just gonna we're gonna use this to make the point, not reality. It's 5 a.m. and at 5 p.m. you are gonna have the choice to turn left or to turn right in an intersection. 5 p.m. you're gonna be driving your car and there's gonna be a choice. You're gonna turn right or you're gonna turn left. You're gonna get to that intersection and you are gonna turn the car one direction or the other. People who say, E, that God knows all of the future without ordaining it. At 5 a.m., 12 hours before you ever get to that intersection, does God know which way you're gonna turn? Yes, even in their view, because they say God knows all of the future. So even in their view, 12 hours earlier, God knows what you don't know yet, because you haven't decided yet, that you're actually going to turn left. God, in fact, knew that, even they would say, from eternity past. He doesn't sovereignly ordain the future, but he knows it. Isn't that the view many of us grew up on in the church? God knows everything that's going to happen, even without ordaining it. 5 a.m., God knew you were going to turn left at 5 p.m. So let me ask you a question just about your experience of being a human being in this situation. When you get to 5 p.m. and you get to that intersection, is your experience that you are trapped or that you could turn right or left? Your experience is the latter. You could turn right or left. You're the one at the intersection. You got the steering wheel. You got right. You have a choice there. If God knew at 5 a.m., because he also knew from eternity past, that you were going to turn left, is it even possible that you would turn right at this moment? What happens if you turn right? God's wrong. He didn't know. He was wrong. So when you get to that moment, what is going to happen is that you will turn left, which is exactly what God knew. You didn't, there was no possibility in reality, in ultimate reality, that you were going to turn right because God can't be wrong. And yet, what was your experience? You had a truly free and meaningful choice. You got to turn the direction you wanted to turn. That's why option E doesn't even work. Because if God didn't ordain the future, he can't even know the future. They're functionally the same thing. And that's why I say people who are logically consistent with E, which is almost nobody, most people who say E, most Christians who say E, would not have thought through the exercise we just went through. <laughs> because if you do, the logically consistent position is that God doesn't know the future, which is open theism. Now again, back to the, how do these views make us feel? Which view can actually give us hope and comfort? Not which view is easy. 
all these views are hard, but which view can actually give us hope and comfort? Do you get any hope and comfort out of a view that denies God's power to stop evil? No. Do you get any hope and comfort from a view that denies God's love? He has all this power, but he doesn't care what happens to his people. What happens? No, that's no hope and comfort. And do you get any pa- any hope and comfort from a view that says God doesn't even know what's going to happen next? Every solution the minds of men create to solve this problem of human suffering is worse than the one God says is true. We make it worse, which, you know, hey, humans, sign up. <laughs> What about the one that um, he did something bad? So in Job, you know. Yeah, God is wanting to punish you. Right, right. You're that, punished. That's okay. And that's actually A. Mm-hmm. It may not be true in a given situation. As it turns out, Job's not being punished. Right. We see what happens. But even if it were true that God is punishing Job, that still recognizes the sovereign ordaining of God for this suffering to take place. Right. So they're going to be wrong in this case. Right. But even that fits in the bucket of, yeah, God's still the one in control and responsible for the suffering. I think that what our minds do are like, oh, yeah, he let this happen because he's bad. I'm not. You got bad. what you deserve. Something. Yeah, right. Yeah, I say that to him not all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Sweet, yeah. sweet justice until it comes for me. Yeah. And then God didn't understand the situation. There's a lot of complexity and nuance here that I need to sort out with God. A lot of details that he'd missed. Uh, what? <laughs> the, I don't mean to make light of this because God's responsibility for the suffering in our lives is on that base level very painful. It makes us ask the why question. God, why do you want this for me? Punishment may be an answer. Quite often it's not the answer. It's something else. It is painful to say, why do you want this for me? It is as painful. Think about um, if John and Fagan were in here. Kids get used to punishment over time. Do you remember the look your toddler or baby gives you the first time you smack their hand? All you've done to that child so far is nurture and care and love and smile and everything has been about, hey baby, everything you do is right. And the first time you smack a child's hand and you, the 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 benevolent God in that child's vision, the one who loves them and does only good for them, just cause them pain. And the look of confusion. Sometimes you see the confusion before you see the response to the pain. What just happened? How different is that from when we suffer and we'd have to look up to God and say, why is this what you want? Why is this your will? Why is this good? And part of the part of the challenging human reality is that much of the time we won't even get an answer this side of the glory. We will get our, our categorical answers, God's glory. We can think through some ways that God might be glorified in a particularly horrible situation. We can think about our becoming more like Christ, our putting sin more to death, and we may see some of that. But in terms of specifically, yeah, couldn't you have done that another way? That's that's a question I ask God a lot. Couldn't I, I believe your purposes are good, but couldn't you have done that another way? And God's answer is, I did it the best way. And I just, ah! Yeah, that's what this book's about. This book is about wrestling with, you have the answer to Job's question in chapter one. You have the answer to all of this. Job is good, it's not punishment. God is good, he is growing Job in his faith. He is embarrassing Satan in the heavenly council. He's glorifying himself through Job's genuine faith. You have all of the answers in chapter one. 
And we're still going to go on this emotional roller coaster with Job for the rest of the book going, yeah, but God, yeah, but God, yeah, we need that. That's, that's really helpful for us. Um, somebody whose name I forgot to write down, write down, but it's in quotation marks. So let's assume that it's either Calvin or Derek Thomas says, in effect, oh yeah, this is in the G, thanks God, because did you notice at the end of the passage there, I mean, Satan either didn't notice Job or pretends not to notice Job. Who's the one who gets Job into this mess? God! God says to Satan, what about Job? You looked at him? Gee, thanks. Friends like these. (laughs) And this brilliant author who wrote some things that I did not attribute to him says, In effect, God was drawing attention to the fact that in Job's life, God was already displaying his victory over Satan. Job was a demonstration of his godliness, a God-wrought holiness indicative of his faith in God's promised Savior. Listen to this. Satan must look on Job as a trophy of redemptive grace. He must admit, after all his scheming and work, that the enmity of the woman's seed against him had already proved effective. This is why Satan hates you so much. You're a trophy of God's redemptive grace. You could not have genuine faith on your own. You could not serve God on your own. You could not repent of sin and walk away from evil and toward holiness on your own. It is impossible. And so when Satan sees someone who actually loves God, Satan is disgusted, repulsed, outraged, and defeated. Because he goes all the way back to Genesis 3, where he brought about the fall of all of mankind. He brought all of us into this rebellion with him and said, ha, God, look, no one loves you. And God says, yeah, that's okay. Watch what I do. And then he does it. And every time Satan sees a genuine believer, not a perfect believer, because we've already talked about Job's goodness. He is not perfect. But every time, Satan sees someone with genuine faith. He sees a trophy of God's redemptive grace. And now here in this council, the text we'll get into next week, Satan's response is cynical. And this is why we have to be very careful with cynicism, which is tough for me. I'm naturally cynical, but cynicism is is often a tool that Satan is using. Uh, Satan has no respect for God. And Satan cannot accept that things can be anything other than what he expects. That's what cynicism is. Cynicism is the world can only be as I expect and know it to be. And so whenever anyone else says something with which you don't agree, doesn't fit your view, you say that can't be right. And you respond, no. Or as we uh, joke at our house, I don't know about that. (laughs) But that, that cynical view, the world is only as I think it can be. That's what Satan's practicing here. And so when God says, Job has genuine faith, Satan says, I don't know about that. What will happen if we take away his stuff and kill his children? And you say, surely God will put that nonsense idea away. Nope, God goes with it. He goes with it. And it's brutal. It is devastating in the life of Job. And it is magnificent for the glory of God and for making Job more like Christ and ready for the day of Christ's coming. You gotta hate this book and you gotta love this book because this is what this is.